That was a uh, very efficient uh, picture. Uh, I, I love that we have the pictures. If that, if that was my family of four, it might have taken a half hour. So <laughs> we, we, we did that very quickly. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Mulford from the US uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, uh, don't worry, I'm one of the, the friendly ones. So <laughs> the, um, we, we've heard, I'm really excited to, uh, to uh, chair this uh, second section. Uh, we've heard, uh, session, excuse me, we've had three outstanding papers so far. We're gonna have three outstanding uh, papers. I've, I've read all of them in, in, in this particular session. Uh, it's gonna be an exciting trip. Uh, first off, we're headed to Italy. Um, Giovanni uh, Gallo is, is going to uh, uh, talk through a paper about uh, wealth inequality and financial literacy. Uh, next, um, Irina uh, Gemmo uh, from the University of Montreal. And I am going to attempt to, uh, this, I, I forgot to say your affiliation. Uh, here we go. The University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. Not bad for a kid, a hearing impaired kid uh, from Western New York. Um, so we, next we'll have, uh, an, excuse me, next we'll have um, uh, uh, Irima Ajimo from UFC of Montreal. She, she has a, a, a paper on the effectiveness of financial education and financial decision making, in particular, the willingness of individuals to pay for financial education. And then last up is, is Jeremy Coe. Uh, from NORC at the University of Chicago, and he'll talk to us about overconfidence and the use of leverage by retail uh, investors in the United States. Um, uh, I'm gonna try to keep my role to being a facilitator and also being an industrious uh, timekeeper in, in, in case uh, the staff here needs um, some assistance. Um, but I should say now, um, if I stray from that role and say something sub substantive, uh, that my views represent um, myself and not those of um, uh, the SEC, its commissioners, or the SEC staff. But first off, we're off to Italy. Giovanni. Okay. So um, thanks a lot, Brian, and thanks, uh, Anna Maria, and all the organizers for the opportunity to present today here this paper I recently wrote with my colleague and friend Alessia Sconti entitled How Much Does Financial Literacy Matter? A Simulation of Potential Influences on Inequality Levels. So we decided to do this paper because talking to each other, we realized that in the literature of inequality and in the literature of financial literacy, um, the, 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 the in, in potential and probably very interesting relationship between inequality and financial literacy is still very few explored. Uh, especially, of course, I, I guess I don't need to explain here what financial literacy is. Uh, so let me just say that there are um, in, there are suggestions in, in the literature showing that actually financial literacy, especially a financial literacy increase, may have a reducing effect on inequality levels, as for example said, said by uh, Kaiser et al. in 2021, saying that financial literacy can be a valid tool to improve financial well-being and behavior of households. About that, we already know several things, driving the fact that probably financial literacy can have a, a progressive effect on the income and wealth uh, um, distribution. For example, we know that financial literacy has a positive impact on wealth management, saving and investment behavior, retirement wealth inequality, um, confidence and financial well-being, uh, chances of obtaining a fair borrowing, uh, economic growth in general and so on. So in, um, for, what, um, for the best of our knowledge, our paper contributes in the literature in two different ways. First of all, uh, we look at the, for the first time, at the financial literacy increase as a, an innovative social policy. And this is particularly important for us, especially in these times post-pandemic, given that as we know, the pandemic probably, uh, for sure, eat the poor the most. 
And, and secondly, because uh, uh, behind the, the, the paper by Anna Maria et al. in 2017 and, and few others, the, the literature still neglects how the, the financial literacy affects the income inequality and uh, uh, in wealth inequality. And moreover, as you will see, our paper suggests and support the idea of introducing uniform and universal policy in order to improve the financial literacy level, such as introducing mandatory financial education in schools. So, based in the, uh, on the influence function regression method proposed by Firpo et al. in 2009, in this paper we want to reply to three different questions. First of all, uh, if financial literacy influences distributional statistics for both the household income and wealth, and uh, if these influences are significant, in which direction they go. So, a, an increase of financial literacy would engender, engender a, a, an increase in, in inequality levels or a reduction in inequality levels. And finally, if these differences change along the distribution and across the population, uh, considering different subgroups of the population. Um, in this paper, we focus on Italy uh, as a case study, um, of course, because, because we are both Italians, but I want to convince you that Italy is an interesting case study uh, for three further reasons. First of all, because Italy uh, is one of the uh, OECD countries with the lowest financial literacy level, because it's the only OECD country reporting a significant gender gap already at the very early stage of life. And finally, because um, until a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, the Italian government decided to introduce from September 2023 mandatory financial education in schools, also thanks to the Anna Maria's work. And, uh, but before that moment, uh, we didn't have mandatory financial education in schools. So, based on the existing literature, um, what we, so as you will see in this paper, we simulate an increase in financial literacy. This increase is not related to a policy in particular, so we don't need to to, to uh, explain a, a treatment and how this treatment, this policy is made. Uh, it's exogenous, as you will see, uh, and hypothetical. But uh, as this increase is universal, we support the fact that probably what could, that up, could happen in the reality is that a, unif um, a universal policy, for example, an educational policy, in, in, for example, the mandatory financial education in school, would improve overall the financial literacy levels in the population, and that would engender an increase in the income values. This increase in the income values in the medium long run should improve wealth values. And finally, if these increases are higher in the left side of the income and wealth distribution, probably uh, we would see some progressive effects in terms of reduction of um, inequality levels. To develop our analysis, we uh, rely on micro data from the Bank of Italy's Household Income and Wealth Survey, uh, called SHIV. There are several uh, waves, but among them we focus on the 2016 one, uh, because it is the only one, the, the last one before the pandemic, and because the 2016 wave is the only one reporting the big three question exactly as defined in the international literature on financial literacy, so that our results are perfectly comparable with, with, the, with the literature on financial literacy. Our sample counts about 7,400 individuals, uh, which are those re responding to the financial literacy module within the survey. And they are, just to give you an idea, mainly householders, which are probably those reporting the highest values of financial literacy within the household. And the householder in this case is defined as the breadwinner. So the individual reporting the highest income uh, uh, within the house. Again, I don't need, uh, the, the, I, we measure uh, financial literacy as usual. So we look at the big three questions uh, very briefly. The first one, as you know, is on numeracy. The second one is on inflation. And the third one is on risk diversification. And uh, as we have several um, econometric results, 
uh, let me be very briefly, uh, very brief on descriptive statistics. Uh, this picture shows you the share of re respondents reporting um, zero, one, two, or three correct answers along the income distribution. The picture is very similar actually for the household wealth. And as you can see, uh, we can clearly see a, a positive correlation between financial literacy and income. In particular, as you can see, the share of individuals reporting three correct answers, so being perfectly literate, is higher uh, in the right side of the distribution. Another picture, this one uh, shows you uh, the, the situation, the distribution of financial literacy in Italy. So we have the lowest uh, financial literacy, uh, one of the lowest financial literacy levels, and we also have differences, strong differences at territorial level. Uh, and, but this picture is just to um, explain why it's important looking at the heterogeneity of the influence of financial literacy across the population. So, <clears throat> we start from a base scenario. The base scenario is the reality, the reality observed in Italy in 2016, where we have a number of individuals reporting zero correct answers. In particular, in Italy, they are 23% of our sample, so more or less 6 million of respondents. And we have a number of individuals reporting three correct answers. What we simulate in this paper is what happens if 10% of individuals uh, reporting zero correct answers starts to report three correct answers, or two or one, Cheter is paribus, so keeping constant uh, all the demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. But our methodology is actually really uh, flexible, so we could also uh, simulate a full swap where everybody reporting zero correct answers starts to report three correct answers. To create these hypothetical scenarios, we use, as I said, the unconditional quantitative regression method proposed by Firpo et al. in 2009. This method is very easy to uh, be uh, implemented because we just need to simulate to, to run OLS estimations, but in this OLS estimation, the dependent variables is not the standard one. Uh, so we focus on two outcome variables. The, um, the household equivalized disposable income and the household equivalized disposable wealth, wealth uh, but they are not our dependent variables. The dependent variables are uh, the individual influence functions on distributional statistics of these variables. In particular, we focus on three different types of um, distributional statistics, the mean value, the Gini index, one of the, the probably the most important inequality index in the literature, and the nine deciles. Um, just to give you an idea, so the, the, the formula, I reported here the formula on how to calculate the influence function on the mean value, uh, which is your, the gap between your income and the population mean value. So if your income is higher than your, the, the population mean value, your influence is positive, otherwise is negative. And uh, <clears throat> what we, uh, we scaled the coefficients to, um, for, in order to have coefficients for a 10% swap. So the, the, let's say the, the minimum that expected for this kind of policy. Um, finally, what we argue in the paper is that as we look, we are looking mainly at uh, householders, those reporting the highest financial literacy level within the household, probably our results are an underestimate of this kind of, so a lower bound of this kind of policy, which has probably the effect will be larger for the total population. Another advantage of the unconditional quantitative regression method is that we can estimate these influences controlling for relevant covariates. In particular, we control for a number of, a great number of covariates looking at the respondents' characteristics such as gender, citizenship, age group, education level, tertiary education of parents, marital status and occupational status, and other household characteristics such as the presence of underage children, household size, work intensity at, at household level and macro regional precedence. And then, as I said, that we also look at the heterogeneous effects by several respondents' characteristics. So, this is probably the, the most important table in our paper, reporting our main results. Um, so, the unconditional effects of an increase in the financial literacy levels on the mean 
value and the Gini index for both the household income and the household wealth. A peculiarity of the uh, unconditional quantile regressions is the fact that we cannot interpret coefficients as usual. For example, this 285 here does not mean that people reporting three correct answers have, have a uh, household income in absolute term 285 euros higher than those reporting zero correct answers. This means that if we replace, if we swap 10% of the population with zero correct answers, ceteris paribus, with people reporting three correct answers, we have uh, an increase in the total uh, mean value uh, for household income by 285 euros, or uh, if we look at the household income uh, wealth, 5,205 euros by, per, per year. This means that, just to give an idea on how much this uh, effect is large, uh, uh, let's think about that um, to obtain the same effect in the population, it, the Italian government should introduce a lump sum transfer giving 200, uh, give, uh, give 285 euros to all Italian households, and this kind of transfer would cost about 7 billion of euros per year. While probably a policy introducing financial literacy cost, would cost much, much less. Okay. And uh, these, eff uh, the, 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 these effects are, as you can see, significant also for a partial increase in financial literacy. Another important result for us is that, okay, the fact that if we improve financial literacy, there is a, an increase in household income and wealth is more or less expected. What was unexpected is the fact that uh, um, the inequality levels uh, actually do not uh, increase, but in, in several cases, they decrease significantly, especially for partial increases in the, in the, in the um, financial literacy levels. To give, um, uh, in order to understand why we report a progressive effect related to the uh, increase in financial literacy, we saw how influences change along the distribution. Probably in this picture uh, that is not clear, but looking at the effects along the household wealth distribution, you can clearly see that the effects are more or less always significant, so above zero, but the effects on, in the left side of the distribution are in the relatively higher with respect to the other ones. Uh, I, I don't know how many minutes I still have. Less than five, okay. So um, going very briefly on heterogeneous effects, just let me say that they, they are a lot. So very briefly, um, the effects on the mean value is more or less the same. There are very few uh, significant differences. So this is good for us. And, and another interesting uh, fact is that the, in, in, uh, often the progressive effect related to an increase in financial literacy is significant, as especially among the most vulnerable categories of respondents. So for example, those reporting uh, a lower uh, education level, those living in the south of Italy, so one of the poorest areas of the country, and among the large uh, families or families with underage children, again, another very vulnerable category uh, uh, for Italy. Finally, uh, we try to understand uh, which is the uh, big three, one of the big three questions is driving our effect. So we replicated our simulation and uh, looking at the uh, people replying don't know, so selecting the don't know option uh, as a baseline and uh, swapping them for people uh, with satiris paribus uh, for individuals reporting wrong answer or correct answers. And as you can see, um, the effect on the mean value is uh, especially related to an increase in uh, the, 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 the correct response of in, uh, questions related to numeracy and risk diversification, while the uh, progressive effect of having an increase in financial literacy is mainly due to an increase on numeracy and inflection knowledge. So, uh, in conclusion, we can actually say that, to some extent, uh, financial literacy can uh, increase, can be considered as an innovative social policy, an innovative way to contrast poverty and inequality. 
uh, especially uh, at least for Italy, um, we observe that the progressive effects of financial literacy appear stronger, especially among the most vulnerable respondents, and uh, uh, just, give, just making very simple math, we see, as I said, that 6 million of respondents in Italy um, reply provide zero correct answers to the big three questions. We simulated a 10% swap, which means that we just need that six, um, 600,000 individuals start responding, three, uh, reporting three correct answers rather than zero. So in Italy, we have uh, every year, uh, uh, so we are reducing our fertility, but still our, every year we are more or less 400,000 newborns. This means that a policy being as possible, universal and uniform, assuming some persistence on the effect of educational, uh, financial education, um, would reach our pop target population in uh, two years. So that would be uh, we, we for um, uh, having a mandatory financial education in school for at least two birth courts would be enough uh, in order to have a similar effect to the one we are simulating. Thanks a lot. Great paper. Questions? Um, I think you touched on it, but um, so what is the cost of providing, like I, I, I see, you know, like you basically put all your, your numbers into context and you say, okay, look, uh, in order to achieve the same effect, we would net, need to have this kind of this uh, big um, um, uh, net transfer. But how costly it is to really raise this uh, financial literacy? I guess uh, probably Anna Maria knows uh, <laughs> the best, is the one that knows it best. But like, and, and also in terms of like, I think all your results are based on, uh, you know, like you, you say, okay, this is the, the marginal benefit for, for uh, increasing financial literacy uh, across different subgroups. But of course, also the marginal cost of improving the situation of these uh, people may be uh, different. So I think that what you're doing is super interesting. But you, one thing that I would love to have is that kind of the, the, the cost analysis, right? So I mean, if you wanted to go and talk to the, the, the governors and, and kind of convince them on, on doing this program, I think you would need to have a kind of a kind of very strong uh, argument for the, for the cost. Yes, uh, I'm, uh, I totally agree with you, Alberto. Thanks for the question. Actually, I'm a researcher on uh, public economics. So this is exactly my point, uh, making a cost-benefit analysis. And so the, the, the law introducing the mandatory financial education in Italy is very um, recent. Uh, we, uh, search, we searched for the amount, the funds uh, put there by the Italian government to implement this kind of policy. Uh, there are no precise amounts. Uh, I just found um, a, a document saying that they will uh, uh, they will uh, um, pay. They will introduce a fund of one million of euros for the uh, teachers' uh, training on financial education, and that's it. I think that one million is. Too low, uh, to 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 uh, yeah, too low. Uh, too few. Probably it will increase over time, but I think that we will stay largely below fifty million of euros. So for sure, uh, the the cost benefit analysis would be positive. But I agree with you. Probably uh, this kind of um, uh, suggestion can be more implemented in the conclusions of the paper. For sure. Thanks. Any other questions? I'll ask one uh, quick one, which is a, a little related, is just sort of thinking about the United States uh, in terms of opportunity costs, and, and this would apply, apply to other jurisdictions. Swapping, um, you know, teachers' days are full. If you're, you're putting in a financial literacy course, are you taking out uh, math instruction or are you taking out art instruction? How, how, how would how would you address a question like that? 
Good question. Um, good question. Actually, so we, of course, uh, as I said to, uh, before, we uh, didn't focus on the type of policy. For sure, this, this kind of educational policy is the one uh, ensuring the universal treatment. Uh, but actually, uh, other policies may, tr may be uh, implemented, but for sure, uh, the, the role of uh, teachers uh, would be uh, important. For now, at the moment, I think that the teachers have a financial literacy uh, level, at, I, I guess, as equal as the other. Uh, maybe a bit higher, as, because in Italy, you have to, be, you have, to have a... a a university degree to become a professor, a teacher, but I don't think how, I don't know how much this means that uh, the financial literacy level is higher. So probably less. But thank you, thank you, very well done. Thank you. Thanks. Our next paper is the the value of financial knowledge. Irina. Hi everyone, I'm Irina, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm an assistant professor at HEC Montréal. This is joint work with Pierre Carmichaud, who's also at HEC Montréal, and Olivia Mitchell, who you probably know from the Wharton School. Well, you probably also know Pierre Carl, but <laughs> nevertheless. Um, so the title of our paper, The Value of Financial Knowledge, is kind of vague. It's still a working paper title. I'll explain to you in a second what we mean with the value. Um, but uh, the motivation of this paper basically comes from the question, why is demand for financial literacy or financial education so low? Like we have a well-documented low demand and we have all kinds of options for free financial education. I mean, in, the, in our age today, even like with ChatGPT, you can just, you know, like ask all kinds of stuff that you want. But still the well-documented low demand, that's kind of our motivation for the paper. And as I said, the value is kind of a, still like a vague title, but what we're referring to here is essentially two sides of the value of financial education or financial knowledge. Um, so this is the subjective side, the subjective value of financial knowledge, which is, which is essentially the type of value that the individual who would be the one acquiring the knowledge or the, um, the education would be placing on it. So what are individuals um, able or willing to pay for some kind of financial education intervention? So this is an experimental setting. So we speak about financial education intervention. What determines their demand for it and also who would be willing to pay more or less for it? But then we have to contrast that value also because it goes together with the objective value of financial knowledge or financial education, which is essentially the effectiveness of it. So are individuals willing to pay more or less because it's more or less effective? That's why we have to take that value into account as well. So do individuals actually improve their financial decision-making after our financial education intervention? And if so, who does? So who does improve more or less? And ideally, and this is maybe the last thing that we're still tweaking on before we can release the working paper, we would like to have kind of a one-on-one -on -one monetary mapping here between what are individuals willing to pay and what is their actual gain from it. <coughs> so I said it's an experimental setup. So here, this is our setup. It was a survey experiment with asking Canadians. So this is a Canadian survey platform, which you can imagine only asks Canadians in fall 2021. Um, so I know it's, uh, that's like one and a half years ago already, right? So um, in our defense, I went on maternity leave in September 2021. So the data was essentially lying around for a year. Um, we have 2,500 subjects aged 25 to 80. And the way that we reward the uh, participants is, well, first they give, get some kind of participation fee. I'm asking Canadians, does it in the way that they get like reward points for Air Canada and so on. So they get like flight, re flight reductions. But also we pay them an extra incentive, which is the return on an allocation task, which I'll show you in a second. So we start with some standard survey questions, which is essentially demographics, preferences, etc., the usual stuff. 
And then we give them important here a hypothetical endowment at this point for the first allocation task. The first allocation task I'll show you in detail, but essentially they have three funds and they should decide how they allocate this hypothetical endowment between those three funds. Afterwards, we asked them for some self-assessment, so how did you think you performed on this task, etc. And then we explained them the following. So now you get a real endowment, so this is not hypothetical anymore, which is $30 Canadian dollars. Um, and uh, you will get, you, you can use those $30 to do exactly the same allocation task that you did before, second time now, but you can also use part of it to purchase a financial education intervention, which we will deliver, which can help you to improve your performance in the second allocation task. So there's a real trade-off here between buying the, the educational treatment and not investing this in the second allocation task, whatever you're spending here. We elicit their willingness to pay for this financial education um, intervention using the Becker de Goldmarschak mechanism, which is essentially they give us a price, um, the maximum willingness to pay, and then our random number generator picks a price. So if their willingness to pay is higher, they buy it. If not, they don't. So given willingness to pay, our assignment to treatment here is still random due to the random number generator if we condition on willingness to pay. And then um, they have the educational treatment. In between, we also kind of ask a question. So what do you think? Um, will the treatment actually help you with the second allocation task? Do you think you will increase your returns? So some kind of self-evaluation, also forward-looking. The treatment, basically, I'll, I'll show you also in um, a bit more detail. We'll just explain diversification and um, risk-adjusted returns. And then afterwards, they do exactly the same portfolio allocation task again. In the end, they get their payoff, which is essentially what they kind of made out of their $30 endowment, given whether or not they purchased the, um, the uh, educational treatment at the price that was generated by the number, um, random number generator, and given what they made in the second portfolio allocation task. Okay, so this is the allocation task, essentially in both cases. They get um, a graphical description of return and, well, chance. We kind of used the terminology to simplify it a little bit, but this is essentially the standard deviation. Um, and then we have three funds, and we tell them just basically mean and sigma for that, and basically let them just decide how they would allocate the $30 in allocation task one, later the $30 minus a potential price. So then we need to define somehow, how do we measure performance in this task? Because there is no such thing here as an optimal allocation if we don't consider the preferences. But the way that we do it is, so here we borrow from the paper um, from Laurent, Laurent Calvé, uh, sorry, Laurent Calvé, <laughs> Um, John Campbell and Paolo Sodini in 2007, the down and out paper, if you know that. So they use the um, relative sharp ratio loss, which is one minus the sharp ratio observed in a household divided by some kind of benchmark sharp ratio. So we don't have a benchmark index, but what we can do is we can say for any, so given this would be your allocation, I could say um, given my sigma that I have, what would be the best mu that I could achieve for the sigma? So essentially, if we do that, then our benchmark sharp ratio is the sharp ratio with the, map, the best mu given our sigma. And then it breaks down to something that we call the relative mean loss. It measures the vertical distance here between your allocation and the efficiency frontier. We can do the same basically reversely by defining the, the distance between your allocation and the efficiency frontier on the horizontal line, and that would be the relative sharp ratio loss. So these are kind of our measures of efficiency here for the first allocation task. Well, the quality is not great <laughs> on the screen here. I hope you can still read it. So this table basically shows the determinants of the performance in the first allocation task. So we have column one to five, which are um, OLS results, and those are kind of mean standard deviation sharp ratio, so the standard measures plus the two that I just described, the relative mean loss and the relative sharp ratio loss. And then in columns six and seven, 
we present marginal results from loaded regression. So here, uh, marginal effects from, um, from loaded regression. So here you see in six, that is one over K. So that's a dummy variable that tells you is, it's one if the individual has just spread their endowment equally across all the assets. In the last one, we see return chasing. So that is just a dummy variable that's one if the individual has just invested everything in the fund with the highest mean return. And we see what are the determinants of this. So cognitive ability is essentially, cognitive ability and numeracy are the only ones who actually increase kind of or are positively related to the standard Sharpe ratio. We do not find any relation to the RML and the RSL. We do find a relation between financial literacy and those people are actually less likely to spread their endowment equally. And finally, those people who have traded stocks before, they're investing a little bit riskier they're less likely to basically just diversify one over K, and they're more likely to just invest everything into the stock with the highest mean return. But this is not really like super important for our results. It's just kind of to see what do they do actually in the first allocation task. <coughs> so now when we elicit the willingness to pay for this educational intervention. Oh, thank you. That's, that's good. Thank you. Um, we, uh, as I said, we elicit this with the Becker de Goldmarschak mechanism that I described already, but we also give them the chance to just cross a little box where it says, I don't want that intervention no matter what, even if I get it for free. Because for some people, it's just a time opportunity cost, and even if they would put zero as a willingness to pay, there's a chance that the random number generator picks the zero and they actually get it. So they can choose not to get it for no matter what. And we see that actually, a quarter of participants do that. So a quarter of participants would rather not get the financial education treatment, even if it's free. Um, we see that the average reported willingness to pay is about $3, so that's a tenth of uh, what we give them as an endowment, and about 43.1% actually received our financial education intervention. So if we look at the determinants of the willingness for education or willingness to pay for education, you see in the first column here, the reject treatment. So that is the dummy for whether you chose that box or not. In the second one, it's, um, it is basically the, the intensive margin. So how much would you actually be willing to pay? And we see, if we look at those self-reported measures, so the kind of the self-evaluation, it's pretty intuitive that people who actually think they can apply the treatment, they're less likely to reject it and they're more likely to, or they're likely to pay more for it. And um, also people who expect that their return in the second task will be higher kind of follow the same reason. We see that people with a higher financial literacy score are less likely to reject a treatment. So are people with a higher numeracy score, but people who have high uh, self-reported financial knowledge, so not revealed what we just saw in scores, but basically higher self-reported one, they're actually paying less for it. So they think, well, I already know a lot, right? So why would I even buy it? <coughs> okay, so very briefly about the intervention. As I said, we just talk about the value of diversification and then also the value of high-risk adjusted portfolio returns. So we give them some graphical and basically verbal examples, always of hypothetical three fund um, situations where they can allocate their, their money um, over those three funds. And then we explain to them, like, if you now spread it all equally here, then this would be your mean, this would be your sigma. We explain to them what is mean and sigma. And then afterwards we say, well, now if you start from this position of spreading them all equal, but you calculate essentially mu over sigma, and you adjust a little bit, you tweak a little bit your investment according to who has the highest risk-adjusted return here, then you can even make more money. So this is how we explain it to them. And then we have to measure also performance, or better performance improvements in the second allocation task. Because again, there's no such thing as an optimal allocation, but we can kind of go in this direction. So we can say, how did, do we measure that they perform better or whether they perform better in the second allocation task than in the first? The way we do that is we've um, kind of defined two new measures. The first one is a change in efficiency. 
which is essentially just a dummy variable that is equal to one if we have decreased either one of the different the, the distances between your allocation and the, the Pareto efficiency frontier, or you have um, basically decreased one of them and left the other one constant. So you haven't worsened your distances, so to say. But as I'll show you in the next graph, you can actually do that and still kind of um, not be welfare improving because you can do that while still kind of adjusting your mu or a sigma in a way that might not fit your preferences. So therefore, we also define a preference independent change in welfare, which is essentially a subgroup of the improvement in efficiency, which means you're not just decreasing your RML and RSL, but you're also increasing your mu or decreasing your sigma. So we look at this graphically to kind of better understand what you can do here. Your first allocation would be the black one. Then if you would have no improvement um, with respect to our two measures, that could be the, the red dots here, because even for instance here from this black to this red dot, you're decreasing your RML, but you're increasing your RSL. So that would not be an improvement. We have an efficiency improvement here in the blue dot, because from the black one to the blue one, both of the distances to the efficiency frontier are smaller. So yes, it's an efficiency improvement. Thank you. But we have also here decreased our mu. So it's not a, wealth, um, a preference independent welfare improvement. But we have those three green dots here. So essentially in these cases, we have improved our efficiency and also improved mu and sigma. So therefore here we have a preference independent welfare improvement. So we use those two measures, but also a few other measures um, to see what our treatment effect is. So for those people um, who have received the treatment, how are they performing better in those changes than the others? We have um, for the sharp ratio, the RML and the RSL, no significant difference. So there's no treatment effect on the standard measures that we would use. But if we look at um, the changes in our dummy variables. So whether somebody who had previously spread all their endowment equally across all three assets also now moved away from this behavior, we have a, few, a huge effect. So we have a 50 percentage point effect here, essentially that people move away from this one over K behavior. This tells us mostly that our treatment kind of increased heterogeneity. So that people do not just think anymore, well, I just do some kind of rule of thumb, but they think more about what they're doing. It doesn't tell us whether they perform better or worse. It's just that kind of people are doing something more non-standard. It also, our treatment also increased the probability of moving away from return chasing. So from putting everything into the asset with the highest or the fund with the highest mean. And for our efficiency matter, measure, we have like basically 20 percentage points increase in efficiency. For welfare, think about that this is a subgroup of efficiency improvement, basically. So welfare improvement is a subgroup of efficiency improvement. Our effect is only three percentage points. Great. Big. Okay. So if we look at those two measures or the two values that we had before, so the subjective one and the objective one, what can we conclude from what we've seen so far? So first of all, one quarter of participants does not want to have that, at all, that treatment at all, do not want to be educated because probably it's some kind of a, a time cost that they don't want to invest. I mean, we can speculate, but that would be my intuition. Um, however, the average reported willingness to pay is 10% given of the endowment, given that they are actually um, stating a willingness to pay. And the willingness to pay is driven by the expectation about the ability to transform that financial information given in the treatment into a higher return. We also see that higher revealed sophistication, so cognitive ability, numeracy scores, etc., actually um, helps with, uh, with or increases the willingness to pay, so makes people want to pay more for the intervention, whereas high self-reported financial knowledge does the opposite. In terms of effectiveness, we know that our treatment really hugely increases heterogeneity in portfolio allocations, but whether it actually improves or not, 
we kind of developed those two new measures for that. So we have the Pareto improvement of portfolio efficiency and the preference independent welfare measure. And we see that our treatment increases the likelihood to achieve these types of performance improvements by 20 slash three percentage points. Um, th so the, as I said in the beginning, there's one more thing that we're currently working on, which is essentially because we cannot just take the, the final return that we gave them as a measure of their monetary improvement because it's just a realization. But what we can do is um, we're now calibrating their utility, etc. So we have the Holden Lorry questions and so on. And therefore, we're just basically um, comparing now their utility in the first task to the utility in the second task and calculate some kind of certainty equivalent to see what should they have paid for the, um, for the intervention in order to have the same utility between those two. And then we can maybe say more about who overpays and who underpays, but yeah. And maybe one last note, um, in general, we also find, because we, I did say that, um, when you, when you believe that you can use the information for the, for the second allocation task, then you're more likely to invest into it, which is quite natural. And we also find that women are less likely to believe so than men. So usually our women here also have a lowered um, willingness to pay for financial education, although they do not have a lower treatment effect. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. I, I stayed at my seat because I was scribbling down a, a lot of notes. We do have some time for some questions. Why don't we start over here? Hi, um, very interesting paper. Um, just first one clarifying question. They, they do observe the payoff after the first decision. Is that right? No. Or, no. no, okay. Um, so I was wondering maybe in the, if, the, if there's like a dynamics to this in the sense that after a payoff is realized, um, you can have some people that just by chance did well, and that may they may attribute that to skill. That's kind of I'm thinking about the literature on illusion of control. If after the payoff, no, they were to attribute to their good decision making that they did well, but that was just by chance, that may further decrease their willingness to pay for financial education, and at the same time, kind of people that did well after receiving the financial education treatment may actually be more willing to do that as well. No? So Again. exactly because we were worried about that. So people um, after the first allocation task observing that they did well or not well and just kind of biasing their information, we didn't tell them how they performed. So there's no realization that's happening based on their portfolio allocation in the first allocation task. It's only happening on the second allocation task. And then it's already too late because that's at the end of the experiment. So they can't be biased anymore. So one question I had was, uh, so the, the willingness to pay, it, do you deduct it from the performance or the performance is not considering that? I, I, I don't think you should, given that that is not something that, the, that that's the maximum willing, that, that the maximum um, willingness they have to pay. But it seems high to me, right? That's, I, I, and I faced exactly something very similar. We have this kind of... Uh, some a similar project, but on the kind of a, a repayment of debt, you know, like a, this kind of robot advisor for debt management decisions. And individuals are very eager to pay a ton of money to have access to the service, which kind of worries me because it means that they probably are susceptible also of being taken advantage of, right? Because you can have a company coming in and extracting of the rents um, from from that. So I was just wondering, first of all, if you consider the willingness to pay in the in the performance, and um, what are your thoughts on the uh, the size of that willingness to pay? So um, we do not consider it in the performance. That is entirely the um, just the returns, so just the funds. But that's basically what I said in the end. What we're still kind of aiming to do is um, to compare the utility of the two tasks, where we will then kind of consider the willingness to pay as a um, reduction in the endowment um, and contrast that then with kind of what they should have paid, like the certainty equivalent. And uh, for your, the second part of so my thoughts on the height, I also think it's pretty high, but um, I think, so two things. First of all, there's a quarter that doesn't want it at all. So I think already those who wouldn't want to pay for it, that's kind of a separate sample already. So we're kind of overestimating it. If we would merge them, then put zeros for the others, it's, it's lower. Um, but also I think 10% is high, but $3, probably for most participants, they don't think in percentage of their endowment. So it's still kind of 
$3 doesn't sound like a big deal. So I think maybe that's also the reason why we see a relatively high number. Mm, yeah. yeah, for sure. We have time for one more question. Um, so one of the things we have learned from the personal finance index is that really do not understand, grasp is risk, right? And the other thing is project uh, with Bernard, where one of the paper on teaching the interest compounding, which actually people get. We also have a project on teaching risk and risk diversification that people do not get, even though we did a very long kind of explanations. And so point here is, you know, do you get at the end unreasonable result or is there a range of result that you get here, even the unwillingness to pay, I guess, you know, that's not bad or some of the things or so on that, you know, in a sense is off the range, meaning people are doing this task, but in fact, they don't grasp it. And then which type of information can you get from that? So we haven't really kind of made a pool of outliers in some sense. Um, so far, our results don't look super funny to us. Um, I must say that, for instance, if we look at the big three questions, there's like 60% in our sample who respond to all three of them correctly. So it's a fairly big number um, in terms of financial literacy. And uh, in cognitive ability and numeracy, it's a little bit different. It's more like 50-50. Um, so, yeah, I, I can only say so far, I think we have a sample that may be a little bit more knowledgeable about risk. We are teaching them a little bit about risk and the treatment as well, but I do not see anything funny about our results in that direction, so that we would think that they just do whatever. But we could... Yeah, exactly. So in the average, we don't see that. But we could maybe isolate like a pool of respondents who, for instance, worsen their their allocation choice tremendously or something like that. But, uh... Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. Our last presenter is uh, Jeremy Coe. Uh, his title of his presentation is Leveraging Overconfidence. So thank you everybody for sticking around for the very last presentation of the day. So I have a bit of a seasonal non-contagious cough right now. I'm probably gonna opt to stay close to the lectern and keep my fluids nearby. This is joint work with Brad Barber, Xing Huang, and Terry O'Dean. I'm currently affiliated with NORC at the University of Chicago, and of course, I should let you know that I speak on behalf only for myself and not for my employer. <clears throat> so the topic of this paper is overconfidence and how it impacts the trading of financial assets, primarily stocks, by retail or individual investors. Now, overconfidence is a cognitive bias that's been widely observed in different domains of decision-making and self-estimation. So for example, if you ask people in a survey whether or not they consider themselves an above average driver, well, typically about 90% and above will say yes. Now, overconfidence has been studied fairly extensively in retail trading, and it's been shown in theory that people, that people who are overconfident should trade excessively and diversify less. So essentially, if you've if you're overconfident and you've got excessive conviction in your view on an asset, you're going to under-diversify and you're going to trade a lot. And in addition, you should perform worse because if you have that excessive conviction, then a lot of times your inference is going to be off. You're going to buy when you should sell and sell when you should buy. Now, empirical research has corroborated that retail investors exhibit this kind of behavior. They trade too much, they perform poorly, and a lot of that seminal work was done by my co-authors, Brad and Terry, and there's other indicative findings there as well. Like, for example, men trade more than women and do worse. So the contribution of this paper is that we link overconfidence to the use of leverage or margin in brokerage accounts. And by margin, we mean borrowing from your broker in order to finance a stock position. <clears throat> now, we do that using three methodologies. We start with a theory, then we take our theory to survey data and then to brokerage administrative data. 
And what our theory says is that overconfidence should increase the use of leverage and trading volume. So it should increase the amount that people trade because again, they've got excessive conviction in their beliefs and they're gonna trade more as a result. And overconfident investors, by which we're trying to capture retail or individual investors, that they should perform worse when trading against better informed and well calibrated investors by whom we're trying to capture institutional or sophisticated investors. And the reason they do so is because, again, their inferences are sometimes off as a result of this excessive conviction. Now, contrast that with a different motive for trading more, and that is if you have better information. And if you've got better information, you're going, you're going to use leverage and you're going to trade more because you've got more conviction. But in contrast, you're going to perform better because your inferences are going to tend to be correct as a result of that superior information. So we corroborate this theory using two sources of data. One, survey data from the FINRA Foundation. This is uh, from 2015, an investor survey. And what we find is that respondents with higher overconfidence by various measures are more likely to report using margin and having margin accounts. Now, we're not sure that they have margin accounts. We're not sure that they use margin. And we don't know anything about their trading performance. So then we take our theory to administrative brokerage data which comes from a large discount broker in the, in the 90s, in the early 90s. And we find that margin account holders and users by a certain proxy, which I'll describe in a moment, that they trade more and they perform worse than those who trade purely in cash. So just to summarize, what we find is that margin investors are more overconfident than other investors in our survey data. That's consistent with an overconfidence-based motive for using margin or, or leverage. In our, in our brokerage data, we observe that margin investors trade more and speculate more. That's consistent with both an overconfidence and an information-based motive. But yet, nonetheless, we observe that margin investors perform worse than cash investors, and that's only consistent with an overconfidence-based motive, not an information-based motive. <clears throat> so we don't want to make overly grandiose claims here. We don't claim that every single investor out there is overconfident, and that's why they use margin. It could be that some possess better information, have higher conviction in their beliefs, and use margin. However, what we do see in our data is that overconfidence is likely a dominant driver um, toward the use of margin. Okay, so why is this study important? Well, it's important from the standpoint of individual market participants, particularly in, in light of recent developments post-COVID, gamified trading apps like Robinhood, which you may have heard of, which encouraged the use of leverage and trading in stock and, and so on. In a recent survey, 67% of individual investors aged 18 to 34 reported to trading using, using margin or options which have embedded leverage during the pandemic. Now, from the standpoint of the aggregate market, I think we all know that using leverage, taking a sex of risk can have spillover effects on the aggregate economy and result in things like asset prices and crashes. So there's been several studies done that have corroborated this. So with the Chinese housing bubble, that's been linked to overconfidence in at least one study. And with the 2015 Chinese stock market bubble and crash, that's been linked to the use of uh, margin in retail accounts. <coughs> okay, so the theory that we develop is a pretty standard theory at this point. And the way that it attempts to model overconfidence is in overestimating the precision of a signal about some risky asset's value. So we have two classes of investors in this model, as I mentioned previously, there's well calibrated investors who are rational. So they, they know the precision of their signal. We're trying to capture sophisticated institutional investors here. And we've also got a second class Um, will boost the use of margin and, and trading volume because they'll increase the conviction that people have in their view and the amount that they want to trade. However, it will decrease the profit of overconfident investors because they tend to be off in their inferences, whereas if they have higher information precision, they're going to make more money. 
Okay, so let me describe our survey data a bit. The core data that we're getting comes from the 2015 investor survey from the National Financial Capability Study that's conducted by the Finner Foundation. This survey covers about 2,000 adults who report to have non-retirement investment accounts. And this is a uh, separate follow-up survey to a much larger survey um, with a nationally representative sample of 28,000 American adults that covers basic financial questions of various kinds. And our sample focuses on 1,600 investors from the investor survey that have complete responses to questions of interest. <clears throat> okay, so now what this survey gives us is it gives us a picture of both investment and financial literacy. So on the investment side, there's a 10 question quiz, and I'm gonna show you some of the questions in a moment uh, with basic, you know, basic questions about investment. Financial literacy quiz, six questions that also includes uh, the big three Lusardi and Mitchell questions. What we do is we convert that score in those quizzes to percentile ranks across respondents. And then we compare that to another question or two questions that are asked on the survey about people's self-assessment of their financial or their investment knowledge. So on a scale from one to seven, how would they rank their knowledge? And we convert that as well to percentile ranks across respondents. And what we do is we subtract those two things to, to try to measure their overconfidence. So I'm, I'm sorry if you can't read this, but this is the investment literacy quiz. It's 10 questions, basic questions on what is a stock, what is a bond. In the US, what's, best, what's special about a municipal bond, historical returns of the S&P 500 index, et cetera. And one very interesting question, at least to us, asks something very basic about the way margin works. So let's say that you invest $500 of your own money to buy $1,000 worth of stock on margin. So in other words, you borrow an additional $500 from your broker. The value of the stock then drops by 50%. You sell approximately how much of your original $500 investment are you left with in the end? And the answer is? That's great. Fantastic. So we've got investment liter literate people who aren't overconfident in this room. So yes, the, the answer is zero. And if you trade in margin, you really ought to know the answer to this question. It's very basic. And one of the really surprising things that we found in a precursor study to this, which was an SEC white paper, is that only 15% of self-reported margin traders got this question right, as opposed to 31% of self-reported non-margin questions, which brought us along this whole path of inquiry um, that led to our investigation related to overconfidence. <clears throat> So what we see in the survey data is that 37.2% self-report to having a margin account, whereas 31.5% self-report to not having one, and then 31.4% don't know. With respect to the use of margin among our total 1,600 sample, we've got 18% of people who say they've used margin and 49.6% who say they have not. <clears throat> now, let me first show you some univariate results that we get from the survey data. So what we see in the light bar is self-assessment with respect to percentile across respondents. And the dark bar, we see literacy, both financial and investment across different kinds of categories of investors, cash accounts, margin accounts, but no margin experience, and then margin trading experience. And what we see is higher self-assessment relative to literacy across these three categories. So we see higher levels of overconfidence across the categories. And these differences are significant at the 1% level. Okay, so in multivariate analyses, what we have here is a regression where the dependent variable is a dummy indicating whether or not they self-report to having a margin account. And on the right-hand side, we have overconfidence, that's the independent variable of interest, and various controls. And what we see on that rightmost specification is that respondents with the highest levels of overconfidence meaning two standard deviations away from the mean in terms of overconfidence, had a 69% or greater chance of having a margin account versus 37% of, responsible of respondents in the total sample. So we're talking about some really economically significant results. So when we zero in on margin use, so here we have the dependent variable being a dummy for whether or not they indicated that they use margin among those who have margin approved accounts. So this sample is only 595 
what we see in our rightmost specification is that respondents with the highest levels of overconfidence, so two standard deviations away from the mean, had a 71% or greater chance of using margin versus 48% of respondents in the sample um, who use margin. So again, very economically significant. <clears throat> so we furthermore look at, the, at brokerage data, which spans the period from 1991 to 1996. This is very well-tread, well-known data at this point that Barbo and Odin have used in their famous studies. And it comes from a large discount broker. It covers 68,000 households and 158,000 accounts. It's got data on trades and monthly positions. And in addition, there's some demographic data for a subset of investors. So anywhere from 27,000 to about 15,000, depending on the particular data item, things like gender, marital status, having kids, wealth, income, self-assessed knowledge, and self-assessed investment experience. So our, our sample consists of 43,000 households that have a non-retirement account because we want to make it equivalent to our survey data. They have only one type of account, either cash or margin, because we want to be able to cleanly differentiate between the two kinds of households. And in addition, they make at least one trade during the sample period so we can say something about their trading performance. Now, unfortunately, in this data, we cannot identify the use of margin directly. So we can't see whether or not someone who bought a stock financed that through their broker. But what we do use instead is a, um, is a proxy, and that is we can see when they sold a stock short. In other words, that's, that's another form of borrowing. So they borrow stock from the broker, they sell it, you know, they're speculating in hopes that the price is going to go down, and then they try to repurchase it at a lower price. Or if they use options, which again, have embedded leverage in them. And in our sample, what we see is 66% of households have a margin account and 13%, according to our proxy, have used margin. Uh, now, what we see um, in terms of trading activity in a univariate sense across different kinds of accounts, cash, margin account, but no margin experience, and then margin experience investors is higher levels of turnover and that's a measure of how much of the portfolio is traded in a particular time period and higher measure and higher measures of speculative trade. And by speculative trade, I mean trading activity that could not come from another source besides speculation. So there's alternative reasons why people might trade. So there's tax loss harvesting. If a stock goes down in value, you may want to sell it in order to realize a tax shield that'll help, help you save in taxes. There's rebalancing motives. So if the value of an asset goes up, you may want to sell it in order to bring down your risk exposure in that asset. And then finally, there's liquidity needs. So you may want to sell an asset because you want to pay a household expense. And what we do is we try to eliminate that um, by looking at very particular trades. These are purchases that are followed. I'm sorry, wait a second. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. It's a sale. It's a full sale followed within three weeks by a purchase of that same asset, which rules out all those alternative explanations. And what we see is higher levels, you know, across these different accounts. So for example, uh, cash accounts have a turnover about 82.9% per year versus margin users who turn over 182, I'm sorry, 183% per year. Um, and these differences again are significant at the 1% level. <clears throat> okay, so now we look at performance and we first look at calendar time portfolios. And what these are, are their portfolios which mimic the trading activity of these various categories of investors, let's say margin users. And they buy all the stocks that those kinds of accounts buy on a particular day, and they short sell all the stocks that were sold on that particular day. And, um, and then they're, they're, it's, hold, it's held for a three-day period, but these findings are re robust to other alternative holding periods like five or 20 days. And what we see is that um, margin users perform worse than both cash and margin account holders, um, but on the order of something like 10 basis points per day. Okay, so this is a pretty substantial amount of underperformance. Um, and on the left-hand side, we've corrected for market returns. On the right-hand side, we've corrected for market returns and various investment factors that we know have performed well over this time period, like value stocks relative to growth stocks. <clears throat> okay, so finally, with respect to performance, we look at regression analysis um, in an, an event time study where on the left-hand side, we have the return of the trade. 
on the right hand side we have the type of account it was whether it's in a margin account or a margin user account and various kinds of controls and what we see here is we've got two different sets of regressions returns following buys and returns following sells for the subsequent three days and what we see is that the underperformance comes predominantly from selling okay selling at the wrong time so what we see is in the subsequent three days if you have a margin account or, mar or you're a margin user the, that stock seems to outperform over the next four days. So in other words, you sold prematurely, okay? You've sold and the stock went back up in value. We're not exactly sure why that is, whether it's some kind of behavioral explanation or it's a result of margin calls, which is a forced liquidation of an asset when the broker sees your, the value of your position going down. So we're not sure exactly what the cause of it, but we do see that it's asymmetric, that the source of the underperformance comes on the sell side. Okay, so to wrap up, we see that in theory, overconfidence increases conviction and beliefs to an excessive degree. So therefore, it increases the amount of trade, the use of margin, and it hurts performance. Um, and we see evidence of that in both survey data and brokerage data that's consistent with this overconfidence-based motive and inconsistent with an information-based motive for trade. So we see that, they tra that margin users trade more, speculate more, that they perform worse. And that leverage as a result, it can um, damage market efficiency and it can damage individual investors' welfare if used by overconfident investors. Okay, so, um, so of course I'd be remiss at this conference not to mention the, you know, the potential of impact of financial education here to remediate some of these issues. So I think it naturally, this research naturally raises the question of whether margin investors would benefit from greater protections or education of some form. Um, now, as I mentioned previously, what we found in this, in this white paper is that 15% of margin traders answered this margin question correctly compared to 31% of non-margin traders. And what's even more telling is that 4.3% of self-reported margin traders responded either do not know or prefer not to say. So th those are possible responses as well whereas 18.3% of non-margin traders did. So not only did they get the question incorrect more often, but they exhibited more overconfidence in their view in the sense that they were less likely to say that they don't know the answer to that question. And so again, that's what set us down this path of inquiry. Now, just to let you know a little bit about the regulatory environment, margin disclosures, this boilerplate margin disclosures that are provided by brokers governed by FINRA's rule 2264, that gives some pretty standardized disclosures. You can lose more than the funds you deposit in the margin account. The firm can force the sale of securities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's pretty well documented at this point that there's, there's companies like Robinhood, which are trying to skirt these regulations or trying to encourage people to trade in, in spite of these, these disclosures and warnings. And I think there's some possible remedies that, that one could look at. One is educational interventions deployed by not-for-profits, you know, individual brokerage firms, gates and warnings. So uh, to improve the, the, the quality of the disclosures that go out to people um, and warn them about the potential effects of, of the use of margin better. And then there's account eligibility standards, which exist for things like margin for options trading, but don't exist for margin. So in that case, a brokerage is, and I believe the rule is FINRA's 2630, the brokerage is required to do some know your customer due diligence and figure out whether or not this option approved account is suitable for this particular investor. You know, why not take that kind of eligibility standard and apply it to the use of margin and other leverage investments. So I, th I think that pretty much wraps up the study. Thanks very much for your time. Let's go to the back here to start. Go ahead. All right, thank you. I thought that was a really great paper, Jeremy. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is um, th this period, like a lot of periods, uh, it, it, on average, the stock market tends to do okay. And so do you think one of the messages here just is don't borrow and sell short, uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and and uh, is there a simple way to teach investors that? And then Related to that, it seems like uh, calling, a lot of Americans, I think, don't have experience with the under, or don't understand that loans traditionally have always been called, 
right? And that's what those disclosures at the end get to. And, and do you think that these uh, results would be different in a different environment where people had more experience with calls? And that's one of the big risks with debt in general is that it can get called. And then finally, I just want to make sure I, I understand something and, and um, emphasize it then. So you say um, <clears throat> that uh, you don't know if the, the cause what, uh, for some of your results was that, in fact, the, the loan was called. It was a margin call. But wouldn't that still then be overconfidence, right? I think that supports your results. That's, that's it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so with respect to the, um, the last question, yeah, probably it would. But I guess there's an open question as to if that, if that margin position weren't called, what would have happened eventually? So, you know, one of the um, events that's, that was cited in the slide deck in the paper is the long-term capital management collapse in the late 90s, which many of us, you know, are, are too young to remember, but, you know, we remember. Um, and I remember hearing from the from some of the principals at long-term capital management that uh, that eventually those asset positions that they had would have gone back up and what they what they experienced was sort of an extended, you know, liquidity event, a market disruption. Um, and so I, I guess there's that open question. I mean, yes, yes, I think it's still indicative in spite of... You, even if there's some institutional friction that's causing this, that it's still indicative of overconfidence. Um, but, uh, but there is that open question. Now, with regard to the, to the first question as to whether or not we should just say, don't use margin, don't use, I think there's, there's differing opinions on this. I mean, I'm kind of of the camp, uh, and I think maybe a lot of people here in financial education would be of this view as well, that yes, I think that's good advice, right? The standard advice is, you know, index, low cost indexing, um, set it, forget it, et cetera. But of course, there's also the libertarian view that that people should, you know, that they should be able to do what they want. I mean, within hopefully, hopefully within some bounds of of um, of rationality, right? So, you know, hopefully the people that are trading in these things that we're giving them uh, appropriate gates and guidance and, and disclosures, such that we're funneling the people with the right expertise into these investments. Uh so one paper that you may not be aware of, so Rolly Heimer and, and Alp Simsek have a paper on exactly <coughs> change in regulation that affect the leverage uh, that people could have. And, and they show these results. And I think they have a diff and diff kind of analysis, which I think it's, a, it's very convincing because what you want to see is the within individual change in, in performance. Because here, the problem is that you're mixing together, like uh, the, the, you may have that it's all selection. Not that I believe it is all selection, but it could be all selection, right? <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're very familiar with the, with the, um, the Heimer, I, I believe it's Simsec paper. Um, and <laughs> so their story, I think, relates more to the disposition effect and less to overconfidence. Um, but yes, I mean, we're... we're uh, we're pretty acutely aware of some of the, you know, the, the, the defects in the, in the research design and are trying to remedy those by running an experiment that'll help us better identify the causal effect of overconfidence on these phenomena. Uh, so I have a question about um, the investor survey. So is the, um, was that correct that a third of people don't know if, they have, if they've got a margin account? Yeah, that's that, using, that's, correct. that's um, correct. How did they answer the question, the the knowledge question? Did they do better than the people who said they had one? Oh gosh, because that would be like next level interesting. Are you, are you talking about? Are you talking about the margin question? Yeah, exactly. Just... The people who said I don't know if I have one. Did they do better than the people who said that they had one? At one, okay. Okay, so at one time I knew the answer to this specific question, and now it's kind of fallen out of my head because like the, the study's fairly. Old, it's kind of older at this point, <laughs> but, uh, but I do know this, if we incorporate those people into, um, if we incorporate the people who say they don't know into, if we lump them in with cash accounts that our findings stay the same. So our, our findings with respect to overconfidence stay the same. So irrespective of how we categorize them, they stay the same. And, you know, my co-authors were very deliberate about making sure that the results were robust to that classification. Yeah, I just think it's worth highlighting if the people who don't even know if those, they have those accounts know the margin question better than the people who have it. Yeah, I, b I believe, my recollection is that, that 
the people who indicated that they use margin were the lowest out of all the subgroups. Um, I, I just find it very striking how you, you show how the difference in assessment of the financial literacy was so large for people with a margin account, but then you also show that people with margin account do so much worse. So I guess I'm just wondering if you can say anything about the dynamics of the use of leverage in the sense that I'm overconfident, but then I'm hit with reality that I did so badly. So I stop using um, leverage. Um, so because in a way, if, if, if you can speak to some dynamics like that, um, kind of like complementary to what you find, it's not only overconfident people, but it's among the overconfident, these are the guys that have not been hit with reality in a way, no? Yeah, so um, unfortunately in this particular study, we don't, we don't look at dynamics, but I believe in this data set, they've looked at, they've looked at these sort of dynamic questions and found, found evidence of bias self-attribution. So in other words, when people lose money, they don't really correct that much, but when they gain money, they, they take even more risk, they trade even more. Uh, I, believe, I believe that's a stylized fact with respect to this data set, but in this particular study, we, we don't look at learning and dynamics. I got a question in the back. Hey, thank you. Very interesting paper. I have questions. Do you see like the quantity of trades this trader can take each day? And I was wondering if we can like link the overconfidence with the number of trades this trader take, uh, and further link it with the performance. Um, I'm sorry. So the, the question is the. So, so I have a hypothesis. I'm thinking like maybe the the, the margin user they have too much confidence and then they overtrade, which leads to they perform worse than the cash user. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's essentially the finding here is that, um, is that the, the margin users are, are trading more and they're also performing worse. Um, you know, and, and uh, I think the bulk, the bulk of the underperformance is on the day of trade. So, you know, they, according to my co-authors, th their interpretation is that they're basically trading on mass with other people at the same time at the wrong time. Um, and that there's an adverse market impact on, on the day, on the moment of the trade, um, when they make it. So, you know, they're trading too much and, and as a result, they're, they're losing money. One final question. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um, I have a question about, so uh, about, about this slide. So what, what, can be do for to, to solve the issues related to our confidence. I was thinking about the fact that probably people have different attitude and different way of experiencing making trading. For example, it's Friday night. Uh, let's do something strange. Let's let's do some uh, trades. Okay. So uh, my 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 um, what I wanted to suggest to you is uh, in the last part of your analysis where you move on the trades. It has a, a unit of observation. The heterogeneity of results by day of week or the hour the trade is made. Just to have an idea for also on the type of policy to implement. So for example, if you do a trade at midnight, uh, probably an alert saying uh, maybe it's too late. Uh, think about that. Uh, tomorrow morning is better. I don't know. Something like that. Uh, it would be interesting. I don't know. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, I'm sort of thinking on that because you know now we have you know not progress, but this was also a policy with an impact. Research with an impact, and we have people with a with an SEC. Um, yeah. Thank you. So you know I cannot pass up this opportunity um, to and to think a little harder about this, right? What can be done because also to continue on like Carly, I mean, like people who don't, you don't even know if they have it, right? And the one, you know, are trading are clueless. So it's like, what can we do? You know, you know and, and, and but can you tell us a little bit about what the SEC is willing maybe to do or, you know, like what is maybe their position that, you know, at the end of the day, there is little that you can do as regulator? <laughs> yeah, it's Friday, it's Thursday. I, I have to say from the, the education perspective. Yeah, that's actually a good, uh, that's a good point, right? Maybe, you know, having a little, 
having a little bit more of knowledge on that and, and maybe trying to inform the people. To their, to their point, they have a nice financial education on their website. So, you know, I would recommend that. Um, and uh, Jeremy, if you now that you are an academic, maybe you can, you know, do you want to say more? Well, well, first of all, we shouldn't just pick on Brian. We should also pick on Gary <laughs> and ask him the same question. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think sort of experimental data on on uh, different kinds of disclosures, warnings would, would be really, really germane. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, Robinhood used to have a have a behavioral group inside of it, and it got gut, it got gutted. So I'm not sure where these experiments could be deployed. These field studies could be deployed, but I think they'd be really, really meaningful. Um, now, now with respect to, to Giovanni's question about um, about day of the week and timing, I mean, I think that's a, a fascinating point about what what times might people lack self control. You know, Friday at midnight being being a, a pretty good candidate. I mean, I think I think one natural thing. I think one good starting point would be to see if there's any literature out there on these kind of like, uh, you know, periodic, periodic times when people might lack self-control um, so that we're not just, you know, because you could find any pattern in the data and, and then tell a story about it after the fact. But to, to have some hypotheses about when, you know, when these peak you know, self lack of self-control times might be might be a good starting point. Okay, thank you. As I've mentioned, it's great to have all of these great uh, people in the room, but also, you know, kind of policymaker and, uh, and be able to speak of topics that can have an impact. And you can see today that many of the topics do have some implication uh, for policy and so on. So I hope you have enjoyed this first day and we have a full day tomorrow uh, waiting for us. We will actually move um, in the other room. Here we are uh, always in the Kind of same floor and uh, you know we'll wait for you uh, we'll wait for you here tomorrow morning we'll uh, we'll have breakfast starting at 8 30 and then we'll uh, start sharp by 9 uh, a.m and please give another round of applause to the speaker today because i think they did a great job there as well and everybody so see you tomorrow and, and use the time to take a picture of the Washington Monument. <laughs> <laughs>